Grace, mercy, and especially peace are yours through faith in your Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you imagine soldiers in the middle of a war zone stopping for Christmas? Would you believe that that happened back in 1914 in the middle of World War I? It was called the Christmas Truce. There were British soldiers and German soldiers in their trenches, cold. They were shooting bullets and mortars at each other, hungry, freezing. All of a sudden they realized it was Christmas. So they started singing. Silent night. Others joined in. Holy night. And then all of a sudden they heard the same music, but in a different language from the other trenches. Bravely, one person stood up and raised his hands. And someone from the other trenches did the same. And they met on the middle of the battlefield, exchanged some gifts, played a game of soccer, and celebrated Christmas with one another in the middle of a war zone as they declared an impromptu truce. That sounds like a made-up story, doesn't it? You know, that's actually a well-documented historical event. Look it up. It's called the Christmas Truce, and it happened in 1914. In a small section of the Western Front, both English and German soldiers declared that impromptu truce and celebrated Christmas with one another playing soccer in the middle of a war zone. Peace on Earth. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? And yet, there was a small section of peace that one Christmas in that small section of the Western Front, but I think that we all know that world peace isn't going to happen. Jesus tells us as much in the Gospels, doesn't he? But Micah's prophecy today not only tells us where the ruler, where the Messiah would come from, but it also tells us about the peace that he brings to us. Jesus gives us peace. How do you unwind? After a long day of work, what do you do to find that rest, that relaxation? Is it just coming home to your family? Do you turn on Sports Center? Maybe find whatever game's on TV? Or find something else on TV? Do you curl up with a good book? Or do you have some other hobbies that help you relax and unwind? Or do you relieve your stress by running or exercising? There's lots of ways that people relax and unwind at the end of a long day. But what is it that really gives you peace? See, all those things I mentioned, they can help you rest, but they don't give you real and lasting peace. And that's a danger that we face, confusing rest with real peace. So many people go through life looking for rest from all the busyness, all the stress, all the worries of their life. But what they really need is peace with their God. There are lots of ways that you can find rest. And you know what one of the easiest ones of them is? Go to bed an hour or two earlier so you get a full eight hours of sleep at night. That'll help you find rest. But rest isn't the same as peace. Real and lasting peace only comes from your relationship with God. See, the Israelites, they had been trying to find earthly peace in other gods. They'd been trying to find earthly security in other gods. Micah prophesied about the same time as Isaiah, and so he had the same challenges with the Israelites that Isaiah did. And a big one was idolatry. He prophesied in the 700s B.C., and his was a message of judgment on the Israelites because of their sin, just like most of the other prophets. But he also pointed them, and he points us, to where we find our true peace. That little baby born in Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem was small, 
But on the other hand, it was also kind of well known because it's where King David came from. And yet, Micah was very specific in his prophecy about where this ruler would come from. Do you know why? There were two Bethlehems, one in the north and one in the south. So Micah says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, letting everyone know it's not the one in the north, but the one in the south of Bethlehem that King David was from. Maybe compare it to Globe. Globe, Arizona. Now, that may sound a little interesting. Globe is pretty small, but it's actually fairly well known in Arizona. Did you know that a little over 100 years ago, when Arizona was about to become a state, that Globe was in the running for the state capital? That shocked me when I found that out. Kind of sad, because it probably hasn't grown all that much since then. Not a lot of famous people have come from Globe, but there is at least one, Rose Mofford, the first female governor of Arizona, born and raised in Globe, Arizona. And so also with Bethlehem. It was near Jerusalem. It was well known because King David was from there, but it was still small. It's not where you'd expect a powerful king to come from. No one would expect him to come from there. You'd expect him to come from Jerusalem. And yet Micah clearly prophesies that he would come from Bethlehem. And when the Magi came looking for Jesus, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they didn't hesitate. They clearly told them the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, quoting Micah's prophecy. It's surprising, and yet, if we really stop and think about it, it's not all that unexpected that God would choose Bethlehem. Now, if you didn't know the circumstances of Jesus' birth, and I told you that God was going to become man, you would probably think that God would be born with a silver spoon in his mouth. You'd probably think that God would be born in a palace to some royal family, right? That would make sense. We would not expect God to be born in a manger. We would not expect Him to live in such poverty. No one would have expected Him to come from Bethlehem. But at the same time, knowing what we know, we should expect it. Shouldn't we? Because God chooses the humble things in this world to keep us humble and to humble those who are wise and proud in their own thoughts, doesn't He? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. Mary says the same thing in our Gospel lesson from today. My soul glorifies the Lord, for He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. It's a good reminder for each and every one of us that it's not because of anything in us that God chose us, but because of His grace, because of His mercy. And that's comforting, because we don't need to look to ourselves for our peace. In fact, I'll, I'll go a little bit farther. If you do look to yourself for your peace, or your wealth, or anything else, you're not going to find it. Those who look for peace in their wealth, you know what happens? They never find it because either they're always looking for more, or they're scared that what they have may be taken away, or, or some combination of both of those. Right? The only place that we find true and lasting peace is in our Savior Jesus. He's the one that will shepherd the flock in the strength of the Lord. Through faith in Him, we can live securely no matter what's happened, no matter what our circumstances this Christmas. Ultimately, the peace that Jesus came to bring, it is not an earthly peace. It's an eternal peace. 
And we have to be careful about confusing the two. Micah says Israel will be abandoned. They felt that way. During their 70 years of captivity in Babylon, Israel felt like God had abandoned them. But he never had. I'd be willing to bet there are times that we've felt the same. When sickness comes. When death comes. When financial disaster comes. When relationships are broken. When other things are broken. We tend to feel God's abandoned us. Where are you, God? But God hasn't. And we know that. We just need to be reminded of that. God will never abandon us. But through those events, through those things, He teaches us not to find our peace, not to find our security in ourselves or in anything in this life, but in Him. He wants us to find our peace in Him. In Jesus, the ruler from Bethlehem. He's the one that reconciled the world with God. The only place we can find our peace is in our Savior. In confirmation class recently, we've been reviewing why Jesus had to be fully God and fully man. He had to be fully man so that he could live under God's law and so that he could die. He had to be fully God so that he could keep God's law perfectly. And so that his death would count for all people everywhere of all time. Paul in Romans 5.19 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. And in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus' life and death in our place is the only thing that gives us true and lasting peace. And through faith in Him, you can wake up each and every day knowing that you are at peace with God. Knowing that all your sins have been forgiven. I'm still amazed every time I, I think about that Christmas truce and what happened. It's just amazing. It gets me wondering, what would world peace really be like? But then you hear things in the news like San Bernardino and all the other violent crimes that you see in the papers and hear about on the news. And then we're reminded all over again, it's not going to happen. At least, not yet. But there will be world peace one day soon when Jesus returns in His glory, when He shows Himself not only as the Lord of this world, but as the Lord of all creation. Then we will enjoy eternal peace with our Savior in heaven. But until that day comes, let us continue to prepare our hearts once again to celebrate our Savior's birth in Bethlehem, the birth of our King, and find our peace in the salvation that He brings. Until that day when Jesus comes to make war cease, let us continue to find our peace in His blood shed for us. And until that day comes, let us continue to share with others who gives us our peace. Jesus gives us our peace. Amen.